correctly. Um, uh, we've tried our best. So Dan Hewitt, uh, Cartmill, Bristol, Year 12, doing biology, chemistry, maths, and history. Welcome, and a good combination of subjects there. Rania Hamid is Year 12, doing biology, chemistry, and maths. Dylan is in Newcastle, doing Year 11. I've chosen maths, chemistry, and biology for A-levels. Good choice. Um, Eshana from Birmingham, Year 12, doing biology, chemistry, and maths. Uh, Muhammad Adnan is a Year 12, doing biology, chemistry, and maths. Um, we're now streaming on YouTube, I think, Mo. Is that correct? Hello? That's, that's right. The, we're we're yeah. live streaming to YouTube. So, so we'll keep an eye on this. So uh, we're just doing the shout outs, guys. If you're on YouTube, so the Inspire Medics YouTube channel, we're now live on there as well. And that's because um, we have 1,300 and something sign up. So after 500, this is going to fill. And we're already on 387, which is great to see. I'm going to carry on doing the shout outs. Mo, keep an eye on the YouTube channel as well. If anyone wants to do a shout out from there, we will. Um, so we were on Ghania Hamid, who's doing year 12, doing biology, chemistry and maths. Tracy, um, year 11, doing chemistry, biology and psychology, hopefully for A-levels. Imad Hussain is in Luton, is a year 12, doing chemistry and maths and biology. Harry Wilton, year nine from South Shields. Uh, Noah from Greater Manchester, Year 12, doing Chemistry, Biology and Maths. Grace is in London, doing Year 12. OK, I know I'm not going to catch up with this. And the reason I know I'm not going to catch up is because it says there's 87 messages down there, which is really, really fast. Jay Singh, OK, Kent, Year 12. Uh, Callum, Cal Callum Galsworthy is Essex, Year 12, doing a combination of sciences. Uh, Desola is in Year 10, hopefully doing a combination of sciences. Francis Spicer, welcome, Francis, from London. Uh, Steffi from year 11, Atuya year 12, uh, Tanya from year, is a year 12 as well, um, doing a combination of sciences, uh, Beta, Tanya, Rain, Mikhail, uh, Steffi, Andrea, Rain, uh, so and up to Andrea are currently year 12s, um, Steffi's from Grantham, welcome Steffi, um, Imran is, from, is, is in London, he's in year 11, uh, as is Rain, is also year 11, as is Holly as well, uh, who's doing a combination, uh, and also philosophy, interesting choice of subjects uh, from Kent. Uh, Pfizer, uh, Oliwa, so Pfizer's in year 12, Oliwa is in year 13, um, Amber is in year 10 from Newcastle, uh, Anwar is London from year 12, we've got Jason, uh, we've got Isabel, both year 11s, both in London. Samiha is a year 10 from Manchester. We've got Freddie from Northamptonshire. Welcome, Freddie. Not too far from Coventry, where iMedics was born. Uh, Laura is a year 11 in Bedford. Ibrahim from Bristol. Charlie from Hampshire. I love this, guys. You're from all over the place. Um, different A-levels, different backgrounds. Great to see the, uh, the audience so far. Um, Haker is year 11 from London, Isabel from year 12 in Manchester, Deborah is also from Manchester but in year 11, William Hackett from Salisbury, Mohammed from Birmingham, Ruth from year 12, Sophia uh, from Mexico, fantastic from Mexico, that's a um, far afield, um, it's doing biology, uh, maths and psychology, Selma is year 10 in Manchester, um, we've got Mehlika, who's a year 11 in Canada. That's interesting. So people from far afield joining as well. Um, Abija from Kent. Cameroon, from year, who's doing year 12, is in Newcastle. Tabitha from Surrey is in year 12, as is Haker. Asif is in Leicester. He's in the first year of a medical physiology degree. Welcome, Asifa. Uh, so that's a graduate entry route I'm assuming you're looking to pursue. And graduate entrants are more than welcome. I am one myself, as you'll find out in a moment. Um, Hannah is year 12. Uh, Maheen is year 12, Alice from Wolverhampton is in year 12, Kathy year 11 from Oxfordshire. Right, I'm going to have to stop there. And the reason why I say that is because it says there's 179 other people, unless Dr. Mo feels he's fast enough to catch up uh, with the number of people um, who have asked for a shelter. At this moment in time, we have 488 people signed in. Um, the only quick thing, guys, before we start is we're just being extra careful because we know um, that there was 1,300 and I think it was, was it 307. Uh, so we just want to make sure that the people, when it gets to 500, um, it will lock out and then those people will go straight onto the Inspire Medics YouTube channel. So it is live streaming to that channel. Um, so we'll just keep a track of that just as we hit that um, 500 mark. So we're up to 493. Um, 
what I'm going to do is uh, so a couple of quick questions firing up. So um, Wei Hatton has said, is the PowerPoint going to be released later? That answer to that question is yes, it will. It will drop into the YouTube channel. Uh, it will also go um, to the um, to the um, Facebook group for how to get into medicine. We'll post those links in and it will be on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, someone asked about certificates, probably not just because there's a thousand plus entrance. Um, there will be certificates for people who attend the virtual work experience. And we'll talk a bit about that later on. Um, and Armin has got a quick question at the moment. I'm doing my A-levels year one. My subjects are biology, chemistry, maths. About my GCSEs, I've got three nines in biochem and physics and two eights in maths and sats, uh, statistics. And in English, I've got a four. If I get three A's, A stars and A2, will the four in English make a problem for me getting into medicine? Very good question. Um, um, it's going to be tricky. So that you do have to have consistent scores. Uh, but the higher you do next, so if you, if you can get, try and rectify that for your A-levels, you still have a good chance. It is worth speaking to your tutors purely because of the COVID pandemic. Your situation has changed and you guys will now be doing things based on what your teachers will predict. Um, but sometimes it can be a disadvantage if you do drop some scores at GCSE level because medicine is really competitive. Sada said, is this something you can put on your application form? Um, would you put it on an application form? Probably not, but when we start the PowerPoint, it will make sense as to why you should attend this webinar. The work experience, which we do offer, virtual work experience, you can put on your webinar, um, but probably not good. You can say you've attended webinars uh, if you've attended our ones before, but you've got to know what you're talking about if the examiners ask you a bit more about what you learned from it. Um, Gloria said, can you become a doctor with a bio? Yes, let's come to the questions later, because otherwise um, we may answer some of them during the webinar. Fair enough. So we've got to 501. Um, so I think it's going to lock out now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a start. So guys, we will answer those questions which are in the Q&A icon. A couple of housekeeping rules. Any questions you have in the Q&A icon, if you press on it, we'll answer those at the end of the webinar halfway through. If you want to discuss something, there's a chat box. We are recording this. We're live streaming to YouTube. So if you're joining us from YouTube, welcome. And this is going to be roughly an hours long webinar. So we keep it fairly compact. Just the information that you need um, at this stage in your career or journey so far. So oh, Dr. Sandu, over to you without further ado. Perfect. So thank you very much, Dr. May. So, so thank you guys. So welcome. I'm sorry we didn't get to finish off all the shout outs, but it became... There was 178 still pending. So uh, this is your Get Into Medical School uh, webinar. It's part of our webinar series from iMedics. Um, some of you would have joined our webinars before, so you will have known that this is part of a series. Um, and there are various other um, webinars that we've done in this series, like the interviews um, and so forth. And there'll be more webinars that are coming up. Um, so what's the, what's the, why are you here? Well, you're here because some of you are either applying for medical school uh, in the coming October. And some of you are thinking about medical school, which we can see from the shout out. Some of you are year 10, year 11, you're, you know, uh, so you're, you're, you're kind of in that mindset of, uh, so you're at the start, so you're somewhere here and there's this very long road that you're about to go down. Um, if you don't get guidance, it can be a very difficult road. It can be a road which, um, you know, can be very hard to navigate. So you do need some support from people who've been there and done it before and that's where we come in so before we go into the powerpoint tell you a bit about myself so some of you have started asking questions and i think dr mo was probably correct when he said don't answer all of them because we will answer them in this powerpoint so um this is me this is me in a nutshell in one slide this is probably five um no, four eight nine, 10, 11, 12, probably about 13, 14 years in the making. So starting off here where some of you are here, I wasn't all that, as you can see, I was very average, you know, some A's, some B's and C's, even the odd D. Now that in theory would not have been enough to get onto medical school. So um, I had to think about what I really wanted to do. Um, and actually at this stage, I wasn't like many of you. I wasn't thinking of medicine. I was thinking more of either dentistry or physiotherapy. Um, and, and medicine is something which came into me much later. So I obviously went on to A-levels and I did psychology, physical education, which I think is very relevant to med school, even though they don't um, have it on the criteria. It's probably more relevant, I would say, than physics and chemistry. 
but because this has a lot of anatomy and physiology that you cover. Um, and of course, I did biology. I scored two A's and a C, which gave me a bit of belief that I could potentially with a bit of hard work, I could go on and get the high grades. Um, so as a 17 year old, I went to the University of Birmingham and I started my physiotherapy degree. Uh, really good degree, very medical, very hands on. Um, you covered anatomy, physiology, respiratory, cardiology, neurology. So pretty much everything that you cover in medicine. Um, I got to know lots of medics, obviously did lots of placements. So I was in hospitals um, for long periods as well. Um, and it was then that I started to develop this interest in possibly going down and becoming a doctor. Um, lots of the medics that I met, my father used to have a fast food restaurant. He wasn't a doctor, they have a fast food place. And I used to work there in the holidays. Um, and there was a there was two graduate entry doctors from University of Warwick who used to come and eat. They were medical students at the time. And they were like, what are you doing at the moment? I'm doing physiotherapy. Why don't you do medicine after this? And they started to plant that seed. And then I started to talk to other doctors that I knew. And it started to become clearer that actually my long term goal was, in fact, to become a doctor. I couldn't see myself as a physiotherapist, although physiotherapy is a great degree. Um, I probably couldn't see myself doing that in the long run. Um, so what did I do? Well, I considered medicine here. But uh, at the time, the universities were saying you need to have, as a graduate, a bit of experience, so 12 months experience um, working in, in a clinical area. So I opted for a master's in sports physio at the University of Birmingham. Again, I was only very, very young at the time. I graduated at 20. Um, so I completed that. Um, and then I applied for the graduate entry medicine and surgery program, which doesn't exist now, unfortunately, in Leicester, at the University of Leicester. Uh, and I was uh, accepted. And then I didn't look back. So that was my kind of journey. I began, uh, I finished medicine in 2012. Um, I've been a doctor for nine years, a GP for about three and a half years. Um, and the logic of this is that from here, I ended up here. So this is the final ever exam that I sat, which was compulsory that I had to do. This was my final member of the Royal College of General Practice exam that you have to do in London. Um, and I scored 95 out of 117, which was one of the highest scores in the country um, for that sitting. And the moral, so some of you would have attended our webinars before, um, so you'll know what this slide means. It means that if I can go from here to here and get to where I am today, then pretty much, every, well, not pretty much, in fact, every single one of you who's attended this webinar um, is able to succeed. You, there, there is no barrier, there should be no barrier. My parents were not doctors. Um, but they did teach me hard work ethic, which I then took with me on this journey. So they worked hard to build their business and, and they instilled that hard work ethic in me and my siblings. I then took that through this journey all the way to the end here. And that culminated in this. So in 2019, I was appointed onto the NHS England Clinical Entrepreneur Programme. Um, and that was for me and it was for iMedics as well, which is who you're joining us with today. Uh, so iMedics was a company I co-founded with Dr. Mo um, with a simple vision, which was to try and make uh, medicine accessible to people um, from all backgrounds, um, at all academic levels, as well as, of course, providing education for medical students, junior doctors, GP trainees, and also international doctors hoping to work in the UK. And there also is also in a humanitarian aid strand to this company, which has been put on halt because of COVID. Um, but we have done some um, work as humanitarian doctors in Greece and also in Bangladesh, which has the largest refugee camp in the world. So moral of the story is very simple. If I can do it, then all of you can do it. And even if you stumble along the way, you just pick yourself up, you learn, you reflect and you come back stronger to take home messages. So. Um, Objectives of this talk. Now, why have we done this doc junior of a doctor journey? So you've had my journey summarised. Um, you do need to know this because you get asked this in the interview. And lots of the doctors, uh, lots of the med students or potential med students seem to struggle because they don't understand what route you take to become a GP. What route do you take to become a medical you know, registrar or a consultant? And what route do you take to be a surgical consultant? And are there any other routes that you can take um, before you get to your end goal. And this is very important because if you get an interview at medical school, you will be asked this, can you tell me um, how long it takes to become a GP and what routes they go through? And many of the candidates will stumble. They won't know um, 
what they should do and how they should answer it. So we always keep things simple. We don't try, we try not to overload your brains. We keep it nice and simple. So the question is, how do you become a, a GP? How do you become a family doctor? Um, you know, from, from the moment you step foot in med school right until the end. You need to know this and so make sure you're listening and then you can register this information and use it when you get this interview question. So the first thing to become a GP in the UK, GPs are the family doctors that you see in your areas. You will spend either four or six years at medical school with most people spending five years. And that's why there's a, there's a range on that first point. Uh, so four years, if you're a graduate student like myself, um, we gave a shout out for someone who's doing medical physiology. Um, so that's an example of someone who will potentially go on to the four year program. That's if you've done a degree before. The majority of people will do the five year program, including some graduates who've done a degree before. And occasionally you have a small number of places on a six year program, which is a pre medical year for those students, small number who may not get the grades in, in chemistry, physics and so forth. And so they have like a pre-clinical year. And if they score well enough, they go in, go on to medical school. So after you've done this four to six years, you're going to do foundation training for two years. This is what we call, these are your junior doctors, FY1 and FY2. So foundation year one, foundation year two. And what happens is um, in, in foundation year one, you start off um, doing four month rotations. So you may do four months in cardiology, four months in respiratory, four months perhaps in obstetrics and gynecology then you um, you know you sign off you don't do any exams you just sign off as long as you meet some competencies like doing blood tech uh, taking blood putting a cannula in um, you know prescribing there's some basic competencies that you have to get signed off and then your supervisor who's normally your consultant at the end of the year will say yep yeah, he or she is okay they've met the competencies they can now go on to foundation year two Foundation year two will be very similar. You'll do different rotations, again, four months. So you may do four months in pediatrics, four months in general practice, four months in A&E, four months in acute medicine, four months in psychiatry. It just depends. I mean, you do have a choice. So when you apply for your jobs, you can try to um, ask for certain rotations. Um, and, and essentially, um, you know, you do that. And then in your second year, in your foundation year two year, you make a decision as to what you want to do next. Now that might be clear in your head. For example, I want to be a GP or I want to be a, a consultant, or you may not be sure. So many doctors at this stage may take a year out. They might what we do become what we call locums, which is they just work um, as and when needed and they get paid on an hourly rate. Um, and then they get some experience, they, they sort their head out and then they go back and do what they want to do. Or some people decide, actually, I know what I want to do. So at the beginning of your foundation year, two year, you start to apply for whatever you want to do next. Now, obviously, I did general practice. And so what you do with general practice is you have an entrance exam. You apply for the entrance exam. It's a multiple choice question exam based on clinical medicine and surgery, pediatrics, psychiatry. And you have to score reasonably well. Um, the higher you score, um, the more likely you are to get a, a placement um, and, and a job and a training program in the area of your choice. So, for example, I live in Coventry. So if you say your family's in Coventry, you may want to obviously you may want to move there, in which case you want to score well enough to make sure that you get Coventry as your first choice. If you don't score well um, and other people score better than you and there's lots of them coming to your area, then you may not get your first choice. You may end up in Worcester or Hereford or somewhere else. Um, and that's purely based on competition. Once you get on, you become a GP. And that is, um, in, in essence, a quick summary of, of these are the kind of rotations that you may do as a junior doctor. So two years in summary, four to six months, you can do some time in medicine, surgery, GP land, psychiatry, peds, obs and gynae, dermatology. So this is just summarizing what we've just told you. And then this is the nuts and bolts. So once you've completed your entrance exam, um, you then start your general practice training, which is what I did. Um, and that was basically um, six month rotations in my area where you spend time again in different fields. It might be six months in cardiology or six months in respiratory or acute medicine. Uh, it might be six months on a surgical ward, like I did six months in ear, nose and throat, which was a very useful job for a GP. Um, 
Some people did obstetrics and gynae, uh, obstetrics and gynecology. Some people do psychiatry. Me and Dr. Mo both did six months in pediatrics, which again is very, very useful and relevant to GPs. Uh, dermatology. Uh, and then you also spend 16 to 18 months in general practice. So some of your second year of your GP training is spent um, doing time, six months in GP, and you spend your last 12 months in a GP surgery where you're with a trainer, you see patients on your own, um, and you get marked. And what happens in GP training is you have two exams. You have one in your second year, which is a clinical exam that you have to score roughly 70 plus percent. Um, and if you pass that, you then go on to the final year of your GP training, where you will do a practical exam, um, which again is, is normally in London, but obviously because of COVID, it's now being held um, remotely via videos. Um, and this is an exam, again, once you pass, you then qualify as a GP um, and you go on and you complete your training. So you can see that the route itself, in theory, after medical school, is five years and that's what it is at this moment in time they often talk about changing this and it might change but five years after completing medical school you in theory after sitting some additional exams can go on and become a gp now there are some other pathways that you should know of so there are other programs that people go on um, that they um that they kind of um when they're not sure what they want to do and there are two to be mindful of. There's something called the Widening Access to Speciality Training Programme, and there's something else called the Broad-Based Training Programme. And if we break that down, um, the only thing you need to know, uh, this programme is currently on hold, but it will be back on track. So if you do know it, it will look good in your medical school interviews. Uh, the Widening Access to Speciality Training is basically after you've done your first two years as a junior doctor, and you're not quite sure what you want to do, you can apply for the widening access to speciality training program. And what will happen is you will spend uh, 12 months working, of which six of those months will be in uh, either one of the specialities that we've mentioned, like cardiology, respiratory, um, acute medicine. And you'll do either six months or so in a psychiatry placement. And you will also spend two weeks doing a taste of a session in, in GP, so working with the doctors and do some mental health taster sessions. Now, after this 12 months, the doctor will then be expected to think, well, okay, now I know what I definitely want to do. I want to become a GP. And then they will apply back onto this program that we mentioned here, which will last three years. Then there's the BBT or the Broad Based Training Program. This is a two year program, which you do after your FY two year. So remember you finish med school, you do two years as foundation doctors, so FY1 and FY2. And then after that, some doctors, again, are not sure what they want to do in the long run. So they can apply for the broad based training program that will last two years. And that will again offer you four to six months placements uh, in medical specialities, like we said, like cardiology, like acute medicine. Four to six months in a GP surgery, four to six months in pediatrics and four to six months in psychiatry. And then after that period, many of the doctors will have probably decided what they want to do. And so when you complete this two year program, you can go into GP training or pediatric speciality training at ST2 level, which is the second year of training without having any further selection. So essentially you would go into this program, but you'd miss the first year and you'll go into the second year and then you'll have one more year and then you'll become a GP. So you become, um, you go, you kind of skip your way through um, if you want to go into a medical speciality or psychiatry, then you, again, you go into the second year and then these, year, these will take a little bit longer. So psychiatry will have uh, five years at ST level and medicine will be very similar to have five years at ST level. And then you'll go on to become a consultant in that speciality of choice. And again, you always have an entrance exam and an exit exam before you become, uh, before you go into it, whether you become a GP or a consultant. Good. So just to summarise, in summary, um, we've talked about the GP training pathway. So how long does it take and what steps do you have to go through to become a GP? We talked about four to six years at med school, two years in foundation training and three years in GP training. We spoke about your foundation years being the first two years after medical school, which are like four to six months rotations. 
and they, they're in a variety of different specialities like we've seen here, like we've got medicine, um, cardiology, respiratory, so forth, surgical specialities like ENT, general surgery, vascular surgery, <coughs> general practice, psychiatry, pediatrics, obstetrics and gynaecology, and dermatology. Then spoken about GP training, which has an entrance exam, and depending on how well you score, you can then go on and get your location and choice of hospitals. Four to six months rotations, again, in either medical speciality, surgical specialities, psychiatry, pediatrics, dermatology, obstetrics and gynaecology. And then you spend 16 to 18 months in the two deep GP surgeries, an exam in the second year and an exam in the final year. The second year is like a written exam and the final year is a practical exam. And then you qualify as a GP. And we've got two other pathways that we've said. We've got the widening access to speciality training, where after your foundation year two, you'll do 12 months, and that will give you an opportunity then to decide what you want to do. Similarly, you've got broad-based training, which is a two-year program after FY2. And again, that will be six months in the following specialities. And on completion, you can go on and go into a speciality. For your information, just to make things even more clear, an FY1 and FY2 stands for foundation, ST stands for speciality trainee, and ST1, ST2, ST3 just means the first year of speciality training. There are three ST years in GP. There are roughly five to seven ST years in some medical specialities like A&E, acute medicine, uh, cardiology, respiratory, and so forth. Uh, but the difference is once you go into those specialities, you will just do that. You won't do anything else. Um, and you'll always have an entrance and an exit exam, depending on how you score, will determine your long term um, outcome and where you get selected onto. So that is a whistle stop tour of um, is a whistle stop tour of um, the work experience, uh, not work experience, the journey. Is there any specific questions that you have, guys? Do let us know before Dr. Mo moves on to the second stage. Okay, guys, there's quite a lot of questions coming through, but some of them are going to be answered in the second half of this webinar, because I'm going to go through how you become a medical consultant or a surgeon in the National Health Service. Um, so we're going to take a very short three to three to five minute interval, just to let you know about the work experience for medical school course that we have. Um, so for medicine, to get into medicine, the medical schools will want to have some evidence that you've done work experience. And that's difficult during COVID because a lot of the hospitals obviously won't allow you to go into them. Um, a lot of the GP surgery say no, it's difficult to get work experience now. And so it's completely acceptable for nearly, with nearly all the medical schools to go on a virtual work experience. And we've specifically tailored this virtual work experience for you guys to include as much as possible. So in terms of the program, uh, you get to hear from GPs. You get to hear uh, and interact with the patient. Uh, there's a hospital consultant guest speaker on the, on the virtual work experience. You hear from a medical student. Then we go through ECGs and chest x-rays. We talk through how, what you see in ECGs and chest x-rays and how to interpret them. Um, you can role play with a patient. One of you can actually have a take a history from a patient with chest pain. You get to observe how blood is taken. Um, you also get to role play a patient who's complaining. So you can be the medical student and there's a role player that we have who has a complaint. Um, you get to see how we manage a angry patient. Uh, and then we talk about other uh, things which are important in medicine, such as dealing with stress. There's a real life CB CBD, which is a case-based discussion. So you actually get to experience what it's like to be a medical student at in the first two to three years of, of medicine. Um, we have a real life patient who talks about their experience as a hospital patient. And then we also show you a real life anatomy pro section where a body cadaver gets opened up and you can see the organs and a specialist explain what the different organs do and the different anatomical parts. And then at the end, we have a quiz and we do have a certificate at the end of this program, which gets sent out that you can download for evidence. And there's a lot of information in there that you can certainly talk about during the interview stage, but also on the person statement. So what Dr. Sandu is going to do is he's going to paste in the link for this work experience. It's only $29.99. Normally it's priced at $49.99. So we've got a discount on there at the moment. Um, there's different dates you can choose from. So Saturday, the 20th of March. Uh, Saturday the 19th of June and Saturday the 18th of September and then also you can book in through Eventbrite 
and I'm going to paste in that link shortly for you guys. So Dr. Sandor will paste in the link for the um, for our website. So there's the Eventbrite link and the link then for the um, for the website. Now I think all of you clicked on the website at the same time and it crashed for like two minutes, but it's now back up from what I can see. So you can book on the website or you can book on um, Eventbrite, whichever one you prefer. Uh, but it's highly, highly recommended. Med like I said, medical schools need you to have some type of work experience before they obviously allow you onto the program into medicine. Because if you don't know what medicine's about, or you haven't seen procedures being done, or you haven't interacted with doctors, then they're, they're going to say, well, do you really have an understanding of what's required or what's done in medicine? And so that's why it's super, super critical. So have a read, have, check out the links. There's lots more information on the URL that we've provided. And now what I'm going to do is uh, bounce actually back into the webinar so that uh, we can go into the second part of this um, free teaching uh, free teaching webinar that we've got for everybody. So I'm just going to um, enlarge the screen. Dr. Sandu, if you can see my screen and hear me clearly, that'd be perfect. Okay, amazing. Okay, guys, my uh, Dr. Sandu's covered the pathway of a GP. Um, I'm now going to cover the pathway of a medical consultant and also a surgeon. And as we said earlier, these are very, very common questions which come up in the interview process during um, your admissions, um, your admissions into medical school. So UCAS personal statements and then interviews. And if you can get this question right during the MMIs or the panel interviews, it's going to put you in a really good place because what the um, admissions tutors do is once you've had your interview, they usually put you into one of three piles. So yes, the app, the, the candidate's been accepted. Two, maybe, or three, no, the candidate's not going to be accepted, i.e. rejected. And you want to be in the pile where you're going to be accepted because that obviously is going to allow you to get an offer from the medical school and then that's going to allow you to go into medicine once you get the grades. So, uh, as I said, Dr. Dr. Sandu's covered GP training. We'll be covering um, the journey of a hospital consultant, a medical consultant, but also a surgeon, which are two very different specialities. Um, so a little bit about me. So who's Dr. Mo? So I'm, I'm, I'm the co-founder, I'm the other co-founder of Inspire Medics. And... Um, I'm actually a currently I'm a working GP, so I, I, I do approximately 16 clinics a month um, and I've been a doctor now for 10 years. Uh, I've been in the National Health Service for 10 years and our my main role in Inspire Medics is to teach doctors and to help doctors pass their exams and also to help students get into medicine. And we teach on average about 12,000 doctors a year now on the iMedics platform. We help 12,000 doctors pass their exams. And so we're fairly good at obviously knowing what's required to get into medicine and also to succeed in medicine. So if there's one place that you want to come to so to get knowledge and information, it will be iMedics, whether it's the virtual work experience where it's these free webinars or this general advice. So what was my journey like? So my journey was very different to Dr. Sandu's because Dr. Sandu was a postgraduate um, um, student in medicine, whereas I was an undergraduate medicine in, in uh, undergraduate student in medicine. And I started my journey off in GCSEs. I know you've got a different system now, which is 9876543. Um, but I, I actually did GCSEs um, a very long time ago. Uh, it was probably at least 15 years ago, if not more. And that was in Coventry. I went to a secondary school called Sydney Stringer, which was an inner city comprehensive. And of course, GCSEs was a two year process at the time. And I, at the time, I managed to get eight, eight A stars, two A's and, and, and one B. Now, that allowed me to apply for medicine because I had enough GCSEs with high enough grades to go on to the next step in the process, which was A-levels. And for A-levels, I did physics. And I know I've written psychics. Uh, I, I did not do psychic A-levels. I did physic A-levels, uh, maths, chemistry and biology. And I managed to get four A's and, and that was done over two years. I applied for four medical schools. I applied for Oxford, Leicester, Hull, York and Birmingham. I got three interviews. So I got interviews with Oxford, Birmingham and Leicester. And I got accepted into uh, Birmingham Medical School and they notified me after Christmas. So most of my interviews were done around about Christmas or this before Christmas. And I was very, very grateful for the offer from Birmingham Medical School. And I actually spent six years at Birmingham Medical School. I, re I retook the third year. Um, and I came out with it with a degree, which was the Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. So MBCHB is Latin for Bachelor of Surgery, Bachelor of Medicine. Um, 
After that, I did two years as a junior doctor. So FY1, foundation year one, and then FY2, foundation year two. And I spent that in the East Midlands. So that was in Northampton and Leicester. Uh, and what you do as a junior doctor is you do um, uh, you do rotation. So every three to four months, you rotate onto a different area of medicine or surgery. So I did acute medicine, urology and neuro rehabilitation. I'll come on to those later. And then in Leicester, I did acute medicine, general practice and colorectal surgery. Once I did my FY1, FY2 years, I moved on to my GP training, which is known as the VTS program, the Vocational tra Training Scheme, which is what Dr. Sandu talks about. And there I did psychiatry, pediatrics, geriatrics and GP. But the difference was that those placements were for six months each. And I also did some acute medicine as well. And then finally, I've been uh, once I passed my um, Royal College exam, so the RCGP, the Royal College of GP exams, I became a member of the Royal College of General Practitioners, and I've been a GP now for five years. So I know what it's been like to be a new GP. I've been obviously working in different parts of the country as an out of hours doctor, as a locum doctor, uh, working within surgeries. Um, and there's lots of things I've done outside of me, outside of clinics. I've done, for example, teaching at Warwick Medical School for communication skills. I've done private medical legal work. Uh, and so there's lots of other things you can do outside of medicine once you become specialized. But let's move on now um, to the real um, part. So, so I included this picture, by the way, because medicine is a marathon. A lot of you, uh, but it feels like you're sprinting during that marathon because you're doing GCSEs, A-levels, into medical school year one, two, three, four, five, six, and more exams, more exams, and more exams. It always feels like a sprint, but actually it's a marathon. It's a long marathon, which feels like you're sprinting all the time. So that's something to, that's very important to remember because a good example is I had to retake the third year, but then you retake it and you move on to the fourth year. So although some of you may not get into medicine the first time, it's always important to remember that it's a marathon and you should always try and reapply and tackle the uh, tackle the problem again that you had or the issue that you had if you were not successful in one area, whether it's grades or interviews, for example. So we're going to begin with um, what, what the journey of a, a doctor who becomes a medical consultant in the National Health Service is like. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down step by step. And I'd like you to either memorize this, write it down in your notebooks or revisit this video on YouTube when we upload it, because this is likely to be a interview question when you get to the interview stage. And a lot of you will get to the interview stage because, because you're doing the right A-levels, you're working hard, you're passionate, you're dedicated, you're enthusiastic. And these are all char characteristics that um, the medical um, admissions tutors like to see. So what, um, what encompasses a medical consultant? So a medical consultant, in a nutshell, is a specialist who does not operate on patients. And he, he or she sees patients in a hospital setting. He usually does a ward round. So he'd be going around on the ward seeing patients on a one-to-one -one basis in a team. The team encompasses junior doctors, uh, specialist doctors who are training to become consultants, nurses, physios, um, occupational um, therapists, and the co medical consultant will also see patients in clinic as well. So uh, in, the, in, the, in the mornings, he'll do a ward round. In the afternoons, he'll do a clinic and see patients face to face, he or she. Now, there are different types of medical consultants um, in, the in a hospital setting that you can go on to become. So there's acute medical consultants. So these are specialists who deal with patients coming into the hospital with acute problems like had a heart attack, had a stroke, had um, urosepsis, which is infection of the bladder or the kidneys, which is spread into the blood, um, had a fall and has, um, for example, developed confusion. That is all dealt with by the acute medical team and the acute medical consultant oversees that team. Um, anesthesia, anesthetics, um, are, they, they are medical consultants. So, so anesthetist would put a patient to sleep during a operation, um, which the surgical team would do. But also the anesthetist would uh, also be in charge of local anesthetics. So uh, numbing perhaps a hand for a localized procedure. Uh, that will be the role of a medical consultant who's an anesthetist. Um, a cardiologist. So a cardiologist is a medical consultant who specializes in the heart 
and the vessels that lead away from the heart. Um, and so they will be in charge of patients who come in with uh, heart attacks once they've been seen by the acute medical consultants. Um, also, cardiologists will oversee things like um, uncontrolled hypertension. Um, they may see some stroke patients as well, uh, but their speciality is to do with the heart. I'm going to whistle through the rest because this, this may go on for quite a while. Oncology is a speciality to do with cancer. Uh, dermatology is, is a speciality to do with skin. So you can get a skin dermatologist who specializes in acne, eczema, psoriasis. Um, endocrinology, an endocrinology consultant would specialize in hormones of the body, uh, so diabetes, um, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, uh, para, uh, uh, para hyperthyroidism. Um, these are all conditions related to endocrinology. Uh, gastroenterology, this is a specialist who would oversee conditions like celiac disease, um, inflammatory bowel disease, um, Crohn's disease, um, um, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, a small number of conditions which will be overseen by gastroenterologists, including hepatitis B, hepatitis C, for example. General medicine, these are consultants who, do, uh, who basic, basically oversee lots of different parts of medicine. So they're generalists within the hospital um, and they can manage lots of different conditions, but they're not, they're not specialists within, within any one condition. Generator urinary medicine is to, do with, um, is to do with sexual health. So treatment of, for example, HIV, chlamydia, and so on and so forth. Um, geriatric medicine is, is old age medicine. So those over the age of 65. Infectious disease medicine is to do with conditions like um, cholera, um, tetanus, um, HIV, hepatitis B. They, delete, they, 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 they um, deal with um, infectious diseases, tropical diseases like malaria. Intensive medicine, these are consultants who work in ITU, HDU, and they deal with um, very, very unwell patients who need, um, who need, for example, life support, who need a ventilator, who need uh, inotropic drugs to keep their blood pressure high. Um, neurology is a speciality to do with the brain and the nerves. So you have a neurologist who's a consultant. Uh, palliative medicine is to do with um, end of life. Um, patients, so cancer patients were end of life, and you have a palliative consultant. Um, renal medicine is to do with the kidneys. Respiratory medicine is obviously to do with the lungs, conditions like emphysema, COPD, um, acute asthma, chronic asthma. Uh, you, could, you could become a consultant within respiratory medicine. Rheumatology is to do with the bones and the joints, so uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Obstetrics and gynecology is to do with um, uh, babies, so the delivery of babies, and gynecology is to do with women's health, so the uterus. Um, a woman may have, for example, um, fibroids. You may have cervical cancer. That will be generally overseen by the gynecology team to begin with, and then it passed over to the oncologist, depending on the workflow, uh, the, the, the pathway of the patient. Occupational um, consultants are consultants who specialize in, um, uh, in medicine in relation to jobs. So, for example, if, there, if a patient had backache, and they work as a warehouse operative, a occupational consultant may see that patient. And then finally, psychiatry um, is broadly classified as a medical speciality. So mental health, you could become a psychiatrist, a medical consultant in psychiatry, and you would oversee patients with schizophrenia, psychosis, bipolar disorder, depression, and so on and so forth. So you can see as a medical consultant, there's lots of different specialities that you can go into, and it's very, very varied. However, it's important to know that the journey into a medical consultant, uh, to become a medical consultant, is broadly speaking the same. So all these specialities, although they're very different, their journeys are pretty much the same. So if you get a interview question in your medical school interview uh, application, um, what is the journey of a medical consultant? This is going to be the answer. So first of all, you do um, between four to six years of medical school. This is your primary degree, which is the Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery. If you're a graduate, it will be only be four years. If you're an undergraduate, it's typically five years. And if you're intercalating, what that means is you do five years and additional degree as well. So you get two degrees. Um, so you might do a degree in biomedical sciences as well as medicine. Um, it, then that means you've intercalated and that's six years in total.
Once you've done that, you are given a provisional license by the GMC. So not a full license, a provisional license, which allows you to work as a foundation year one doctor, a junior doctor in a hospital setting. And you do a year of that spread over three or four posts in different specialities in medicine and surgery. So you could be in acute medicine, colorectal surgery, and then you could be doing, for example, um, cardiology in the hospital as a junior doctor. And then once you've done that uh, and you've fulfilled your competencies, so you have to fill out an online portfolio, the GMC give you a full license, a full license to be a general uh, on the General Medical Council's register, and you move on to your FY2 years. So in your FY2 year, you again do three to four month posts. So you do three or four on average in a year. And it's very similar. You do surgical rotation. So it could be uh, vascular surgery. It could be respiratory medicine. It could be rehabilitation medicine. But as an FY2, you're also allowed to do general practice. So you may do three months or four months in general practice as well as a foundation year two doctor. So under the supervision of a GP. Now, this is where it becomes interesting because this is where the route of a medical consultant and the route of a surgical consultant and a GP changes. So once you've done your FY2, if you want to become a medical consultant, you have to apply for internal medicine training. Uh, and that allows you to become a core medical trainee. And a core medical trainee is a two year program which rotates you through various different medical specialities, respiratory um, uh, for gastroenterology, neurology, um, um, infectious diseases, as an example. And then when you've done those two years, you must pass the MRCP. So this is the membership of the Royal College of Physicians exam. And once you've passed that, you can then go into medical speciality training. So you do your IMT training first, two years, you pass the exam, and then you can go into your specific medical speciality training. And at that point, that's when you decide what specific area of medicine you want to become a medical consultant in. So you do your two years, which are which which basically give you a flavor of all these different things. And then from there, you can decide what you want to do. So let's say you want to become a uh, cardiologist. So at that point, um, you would do between six to eight years of speciality training within cardiology. And then your post would generally be anywhere between four to six months, sometimes 12 months within each department or each hospital because they move you around so you can increase your experience. And then you must sit and pass your FRCP, your Fellowship of Royal College of Physicians exam, before you become a consultant. So um, once you've done that, you become a consultant, you're awarded your CCT and you become a cardiologist in your career lifelong. So just to recap, for those of you who may have missed or not um, fully uh, perhaps absorb that information. For between four to six years in medical school, after that you do your FY1 year, then you do your FY2 year, so those are junior doctor years. Then you do your internal medicine training that exposes you to all the different medical specialities. That means you're a core medical trainee. And then you move on to your um, medical speciality training, and that would mean you're a um, let's say you're uh, your ST level three, ST level four, sorry, um, core trainee level one, core trainee level two, that'll be those first two years. Um, but then you get your uh, specialty training, which is then you become a specialty registrar years four, five, six onwards. Once you've passed your FRCP exam, you're, you're awarded a CCT, which then allows you to become a consultant within the specialty that you've applied for. So that's the journey of a medical consultant. Moving onwards, for those of you who are budding surgeons, there is a wide variety of surgical specialities you can go into. So you could become a cardiothoracic surgeon, so a heart surgeon. You could be a general surgeon, so you do lots of different things. Um, that you, you, you operate on different parts of the body, but you're not a specialist in any one thing. Um, you're a neurosurgeon, also known as a brain surgeon. You could become a uh, maxillofacial surgeon, so you operate on areas to do with the jaw and the face. You could be an ENT surgeon, so you only specialize or deal with the ear, the nose, and the throat. You could be a pediatric surgeon, so you only operate on children, 
or, or young people under the age of 16 to 18. You could be an orthopedic surgeon, so this is to do with bones and joints. You could be a urologist, which means you only deal with the bladder, the prostate gland, and the kidneys, the ureters. Uh, you could be a hepatobiliary surgeon, so you deal with the liver or you operate on the liver and the, and the, um, the gallbladder. You could be a vascular surgeon, so you only operate on blood vessels. You could be a plastic surgeon, so that's skin, so you, you operate on burns, for example, or skin which has been damaged. Or you could be what we call an upper GI or a lower GI surgeon, so you can operate on the, on the GI system, so the gastrointestinal system, so that if you're lower GI, it could be the large colon, uh, the large bowel and small bowel and the colon, uh, or if you're an upper GI consultant, you only operate on the stomach or the esophagus. So there's a wide variety of specialities you can go into as a surgeon. Again, this to recap, um, the initial training for a surgeon is, is, is the same as a, uh, as a medical consultant. So medical school, FY1, FY2, but that's where the career route then changes. In order to become a surgeon, you then must do core surgical training, CST training, and you become a core surgical trainee, and you must do that for two years, and you rotate through various different surgical specialities, so you get to see all these different things as a core surgical trainee. So you get exposed to them, you see what's involved, so you can then choose which area you specifically want to go into. So that's two years. And in order to move on from there, you must sit your MRCS exam, um, which is your uh, membership of the Royal College of Surgeon exams. And once you've passed that, then you can apply for medical, uh, sorry, surgical, that should say surgical, surgical specialty training. So what that means is you choose which area of surgery you want to go into. And that process, once you start that process, lasts anywhere between six to eight years in the area that you want to specialize. And the post that you do, so, you, so let's say you want to become a cardiothoracic surgeon, so you want to be a heart surgeon. Um, that probably will be an eight-year process. You would rotate with different heart, heart surgical teams in the hospital, but also within the locality. So you go to three, four different hospitals, maybe five, six different hospitals. And at the end of that, whilst you're doing the training, you're, 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 you're preparing your portfolio, you're submitting evidence that you've been in theatres, helping the surgeon, that you've done various competencies like uh, opening up a sternum, suturing the heart, for example. At the end of that process, you sit the FRCS exam. That's the fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeon exams. And if you pass that, then you're awarded a CCT. CCT stands for Certificate of Completion of Training, and that means you've become a consultant. And as you can see, if you've totted up the numbers, five years here, two years here, seven years, another two years here, nine years, another eight years, 17 years, perhaps, until you become a heart surgeon. And so it's quite a long career journey, but it, it, the reason it's a long career journey is because you get to see all the different specialities, you get to choose if you want to go into general practice, medicine or, or surgery. And then from there, you start your specialist training. So you become an, an expert in the area that you're going to practice in. So, guys, what we're going to do, we're going to bounce out because we're now going to take some questions. There are a lot of questions which have built up in the Q&A icon. I was going to pause the chat there for a second. Uh, I'm going to get Dr. Sandu back on the screen as well. Yeah, so I'm actually troubleshooting as we go because there's been like lots and lots of questions. So I'm answering them as we go along. But what we may have to do, because there is a bit of a pattern um, that has emerged with a lot of these questions. So um, let's start. Um, OK, so let, we're going we're gonna to be trying to be quite quick, guys, because there's at least, in fact, when I started answering these questions, there was 51. So I thought I was getting through. As you can see, we've now got 59. So that means that the question now got 62. So questions are going up as we speak. So let's try and be quick and go through it for you. So Jack has got a question. I'm year 13. I've been offered a place for biology at St. Andrews. And I was thinking of doing medicine as a postgrad. I was hoping to pursue the consultant pathway for sport and exercise medicine. Do you think this is a reasonable pathway into medicine? Uh, so Jack, if your grades are obviously not going to be... Um, for medical school first time, then doing a degree in biology is absolutely fine. Um, there's nothing wrong at all in you doing that. Uh, sport and exercise medicine is a new pathway and actually you can go and try and find the shortest way to get there, which for you would be foundation year one. So uh, graduate entry medicine, which is a four year degree after your biology, FY1, FY2, 
three years of GP training, and then you can go on to a sport and exercise medicine pathway. Um, so that would be the way I would do your thing. Um, question from Anonymous. We should have covered that. So you didn't do well at GCSEs. Do you think it will have an impact on my university applications? If you're really off, you should obviously discuss that with your careers advisors. Um, and they will guide you about whether you should perhaps go down a different route, like our first question uh, from Andrew, where, which may mean you go and do uh, a, another degree before you go in, if you're way off. Otherwise, it will just be, um, otherwise, you'll still be running uh, from different sides. Uh, so that's from there. Um, Dilvin, will you be covering personal statements? Dilvin, if you head over to the iMedics YouTube channel, you'll see that we've already covered personal statements in our first webinar of this year. Uh, and also join the Facebook group. I think Dr. Mo will put the link in for you. If you go back to the iMedics Facebook Med School Entry Preparation Group, uh, you'll see the previous webinars in there of which personal statements on there. As, and also if you subscribe to the Inspire Medics YouTube channel, you will see it in there as well. Um, what's the difference between UK CAT and BMAT and which is better or should I take both? Um, so in theory, no one is better than the other. I would say UK CAT from a personal experience is a little bit easier, but it, you know, it's more to do with pattern recognition. But of course, if you take both, you increase, open up the options of the amount of med schools you can apply for. Um, in GCSEs, um, okay, so with a similar themed questions, because lots of you have similar themed questions, if your grades are not good enough, you probably will not get onto medical school. And the simple reason for that is it's very, very competitive. Um, so I'm looking at the screen here, guys. So just forgive me if I'm not making eye contact with your camera, but um, essentially um, the, the, there's so much competition. So you're gonna have uh, your 13s who are scoring, who've scored A stars at GCSE. They've got top A grades at A level. And if you don't have that, you're already going to be pushed down the ranks. So um, in response to lots of people who have asked similar questions, you'll have to think about either redoing um, or you'll have to think about, um, you know, obviously going down an alternative route, which is obviously graduate entry medicine. Um, how much extra reading do we need to do? Uh, I'm not sure where that question's going. So reading in terms of the, the med school application, um, you know, you've got, you need work experience, um, and you're going to need um, you're going to need to do work experience. You're going to need to obviously make sure um, you're familiar with the personal statement um, and you're familiar with the interviews, which of course iMedics helps you with. If you're talking about the degree, you have to do a lot of reading as a medical student: anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, genetics, all of those things in your first year. After which the degree becomes a lot more clinical. Um, funding is interesting. So, question from Bobby about graduate entry. Um, you will have to speak to your careers teams just because this changes all the time. When I did it, the graduate entry medicine degree was really competitive because we paid for the first year and then we got NHS bursaries for the remaining three years. Um, and so that was very good. And that's why it's so competitive because all the graduates were applying for it for that, you know, for that as well. Um, so that does change. So you do have to discuss that with your local careers advisors because that keeps changing all the time. Uh, Yasin, um, So, you've, you, so Yasin has got, a, a, I'm a current access to higher education level three student doing triple science. I've applied for clinical sciences uh, and will be transferring into medicine for the foundation year. I've got 17 GCSEs. Any advice for me to stand out from the competition? Work experience, so um, whether that's in a care home, whether that's the iMedics virtual work experience, whether it's volunteering in a pharmacy. Um, this, the work experience is hard to get now, which is why we've made it virtual. Um, but generally speaking, any kind of caring work experience projects that you might want to do, um, you know, health related projects, nutrition, motivation, uh, those kind of things will be helpful in your application. Um, so, again, similar answer. So I'm going to dismiss that. So, guys, remember, we've got hundreds of we've got literally 76 questions so far. So uh, Selma is saying, why is it such a long process to become a GP? Uh, in response to that, it's because it's um, a, 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 a speciality where you have to know a little bit of everything. So myself and Dr. Mo are GPs. We get paediatric cases. We get skin disease. We get acute problems. We get cancer cases. We get end of life cases. We get bread and butter cases. We get kids. We get elderly people. So you have to know a little bit of everything, which is why it takes a bit of time. 
Salary for a foundation doctor will vary from about £30,000 a year, and it will depend on the amount of nights and on calls that you do as well. If you weren't a doctor, what profession would you choose? I would probably be a physiotherapist, which is what I was going to do. Not sure what Dr. Murray would have done. I'm sure he will tell us shortly. Um, question about recommendations for universities that are slightly less competitive. I dare I say there's no such thing. They're all very competitive. Um, <clears throat> do you have to do triple science to become A level? So we have kind of touched on that. So um, if your grades are not what the universities are looking for, um, but you have to make sure that, you know, if you, if you, then you have to think about going down alternative routes if you're not going to get there. Um, so that's done. Um, Lydia's got a question. I don't know if chemistry, but I have biology and psychology, but not chemistry. So again, in theory, you should be okay if your third, a bit more depends on what your third A level is and what you score in it. Um, but some universities will be quite clear and they will tell you we want biology and chemistry. From a personal perspective, I don't think you should need chemistry. Um, I think PE, physical education, is more relevant to medicine. But unfortunately, when the universities make their criteria, they're quite clear that you need to get an A star or what have you, an A in biology and chemistry. So, you know, and if, if you're not on there, you'll obviously be. Um, going to struggle there so nor are you going to do the redo the interviews uh, so we will be doing the interviews closer to next year uh, but we do have the interview um, webinar which you can watch back in the facebook iMedics revision group which again the link will be down below um, and you can watch it back on the inspire medics youtube channel we also do mock interviews we have just done a set uh, and I just found out one of the guys that I did has just been offered a place at the University of Birmingham, uh, which is great to hear. But um, but that's for the current the current um, year 13s who um, have got med school interviews coming. So we do do virtual um, mock interviews as well. Uh, Dr. Mo will put that link in for you. Um, is it necessary to interact with patients or doctors or and observations? be fine so work experience the reason we did the work experience as we've done it is because um one it's very difficult to get all of you guys into gp surgeries there's child protection issues and patients giving consent the second thing is there's a lot of competition to get hospital placements so people are finding that there are huge waiting lists and that's why we've got a virtual work experience um which is a full day gives you a flavour of you watch observed consultations, you speak to specialists, you get to do some role play, you get to see some anatomy and dissection, and it's relevant and accepted for your medical school interview because of the COVID pandemic, many of you were not going to get it, um, placements anyway. And also you'll also see that most virtual work experiences are very, very expensive. If you want to spend hundreds of pounds, of course you can go and do them, uh, but our one's 30 pound, very cheap. And you can read the reviews if you Google Inspire Medics and you'll see what the um, first batch of sixth form and postgrad students felt about it. So, um, you know, make the right choice. It will help you. Um, do you have an option to help with interviews and personal statements? So just answered that. So, Dr. Mo, if you want to type, want to pop in the personal statement and interview links. And also, guys, go back to the Facebook group and the YouTube group. Lots of this is already on there on the previous webinars that we've done. Um, <clears throat> would it be different if I did a foundation year before, go, before going into a medical degree? Uh, so remember, foundation degrees are quite um, quite, ex at, uh, quite competitive. There's not many spaces, but if you get it and your grades are not up to, up to the kind of level that they need, then it's certainly a very good option to do. Uh, Joshua, what's the stigma um, about men entering obs and gynae? Um, very good question. I mean, it's difficult. There are lots of men who do obs and gynae. Of course, um, you know, it, it's, um, th th there's elements. I mean, it comes down to um, what you enjoy doing clinically and whether you feel you'll be good at that speciality. Lots of men do obstetrics, lots of men do gynecology. Um, but yes, I can understand that there's sometimes people think there's a stigma there. Um, but, you know, what, what my advice would be is you wait for your clinical years, your FY1, FY2 years, you get exposure to the specialities and you start to develop a genuine interest in what you can see yourself doing for the rest of your life. Um, do neurologists and neurosurgeons go through the same training? The answer to that is no. Uh, the neurologists go through the medical training. 
the neurosurgeons go through the surgical pathway. You can indeed take years out after FY2. Um, so that's done there. Um, if you missed the live video, somebody asked a question, uh, it will be put back in the group. Dr. Mary, do you want to do a quick swap over just to see um, if there's anything you want to troubleshoot from these questions? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, so guys, don't forget. Quite similar. Yeah, so guys, don't forget the virtual work experience, only twenty nine ninety nine. It's a full day. Uh, there are different work experiences you can get. So there are some free ones, for example, and there's some paid for ones which are quite expensive, like 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 pounds. But what we've done is we've, we've kept it high quality, but still very affordable. So we get uh, consultants who appear, GPs who appear, medical students who appear. Uh, we do live uh, pro sections, live procedures. I mean, it's jam packed. And all those who attended um, on the last one found it really, really valuable. And we do a certificate at the end. So if, it, if you have in any doubt in your mind that you're not sure, I'd book onto it because that will be one of the best $29.99 you've ever spent. And it'll really show in the interview stage because you can talk about things like phlebotomy or seeing a patient um, uh, in an acute medical emergency occurring because we, we, we show that in our webinar, uh, in our virtual work experience. Um, and you can talk about those things. And you've got two GPs talking about it as well who, who, who oversee the entire day. Whereas with some of the other virtual work experiences, you don't get doctors, you get medical students sometimes. And that really isn't good because you want to know the information that the admissions tutors are going to ask. So if you've got any doubt in your mind, just, just book into it. You will not regret it. Uh, and all the, all the students who have been on it have said amazing things. And if you're still unsure, go to Google, type in iMedics and read the reviews because anyone who's attended has left us reviews. In fact, shall we do that now, Vikas? Uh, get get yeah. them. Yeah. Can you guys leave us a Google review now if, that's, if you found this useful? So the way to do it is... If you type in iMedics into Google, and then all you need to do is scroll down, and where it says Google Reviews, if you click on that, you can then leave us a review. So if you click on Google Reviews, because we do this for free, you know, we're two working GPs who take time out of our, our schedule to do these free teaching webinars. And then if you click on the Google Reviews, it'll pop out with a box, and then you can leave us a review. And what I'll do is I'll also, um, I'll also give you a link, a direct link, which you can click on. So, so guys, is it doing that, I'm just still just typing through some of the Q and A. Um, I'm just doing some of the Q and A while you do that. So guys, if you don't mind leaving us a nice review, it literally takes 20 seconds on Google, just to show your appreciation for the free webinar from two um, UK GPs. Uh, we're not aware of many GPs who do something similar. So um, if you could leave us like a nice message on, on, on Google, a nice review would really, really appreciate myself, Dr. Dr. Mo and Dr. Sandu Woods. But what I'm going to do in the chat box, I'm going to give you the direct link. So if you click on that direct link, um, it'll take you straight to the Google page where you can leave us a review. And then just click on the reviews um, uh, um, URL, leave a review. Hopefully it's a nice review, like a five-star review, if you don't mind. But we'll leave that to you guys. Um, and then um, it takes 20 seconds just to put in your message um, or your comment. So it's going to bring up the link so I can share it with you guys. And then, of course, whilst we're doing that, Dr. Sandu is actually answering all the questions that you guys have. There's, there's probably about 70, 80 different questions, which you have. A lot of them are very similarly themed, like do I need the grades? What work experience do I need to do? Um, what kind of ex work experience should I be doing? Do um, How do I get voluntary work? So uh, the very similarly themed questions, which of course we can answer. So I'm just going to go into the chat box for you guys. Um, there is a uh, Ruby. So there is a, a limit to our virtual work experience of 500 places. Um, and we'll be doing it next year as well. So guys, I've just put in the link for the Google reviews. It literally takes 20 seconds. Um, and if you could, if you, if you click on the link, If you leave us a review, we'd really, really appreciate it. And so um, we're just going to bounce it. I think we'll, we'll probably do about five or 10 more questions. Vikas, what are your thoughts? Do you, how many more questions do you want to go yeah, through? Yeah, no, because I think the list going up, I mean, I'm answering them, but we've still we've got 94. So people, and lots of the questions are very similar. So just a couple of ones that I've picked up on. So uh, if you want to be a paramedic, 
um, then no, you don't go to medical school. You, the paramedics have a separate degree and a separate course, and the grade requirements are not as strict as they are for, for medicine. So yeah, that's the question for that. GCSE, so quick summary of some of the questions. So GCSEs, if your GCSE grades are not good enough, you will not get onto medical school, no matter what you try to do to get around that. So you'll have to go around a graduate entry course or indeed a foundation year. But remember, the foundation year is very competitive and only has a small number of spaces. Um, the graduate entry route is very good for those who um, may not be thinking of medicine as their first degree, as, as a, from a young age, or they may not have had the GCSEs or A-level choices, in which case graduate entry medicine is a very good option. It's four years, and then you can go on and go into the degree. Um, and then let's have a look. So... Um, Yeah, so work experience is very important. It needs to be part of your uh, personal statement and it'll be something that you'll be quizzed on during your, um, your actual kind of um, your medical school interview. And of course, because you're part of a pandemic, you will not get work experience in the hospital. Even before the pandemic, there was a long, long waiting list. Um, and of course, it's very difficult in GP surgeries as well. So um, some of you have asked, is virtual work experience okay? The answer is yes, it is. Uh, very useful you get lots of clinical exposure and lots to reflect on and you'll get a certificate as well which you can use as evidence but you don't need to submit it anyway because it's more of the physical experience that you see that you reflect on and learn from and um, which you can then use for your applications um in terms of kind of um other careers so some people have said what if i don't get onto medicine uh you're going to have to consider something different and by something different we mean whether it's pharmacy physiotherapy or nursing um, midwifery you know, there's lots of different uh, ways or other healthcare related careers that you can go into should you not be successful um, with your med school um, entry application um, but remember well, like you said to me, we've said to you before don't be disheartened it's not um, you know you shouldn't look at it as if I don't get there the first time will I struggle the question is you know you use the time, you, you know, use it to learn from any setbacks and come back because you won't be the first set of people um, who struggled and not managed to achieve, you know, and people got there, I got there, Dr. Mo's got there, and we know many other students have got there as well. So um, anything you want to add on, Dr. Mo? Yeah, we've answered about 100 questions between us so far, whether they're live or types. I think we'll pick out a few more questions to uh, VCAS if it's okay. Yeah. And then uh, we can wrap up. So let's see. Um, so Anonymous says, is the core training and extra speciality training necessary for every doctor when working in a hospital? So the short answer is if you want to be a surgical a surgeon or a medical consultant, you have to do the core training and the extra speciality training. Um, that's a must, I'm afraid, in order to become the type of specialist you want to be. Um, let's see. I'm going, to, I'm going to just cherry pick. Uh, can we connect on LinkedIn? Yes, you can. On our website at the bottom, there's the, there's a LinkedIn icon. You can click on, on that and um, we can connect. So that's our Inspire Medics um, LinkedIn profile. Let's see. Can you... I'm just going to cherry pick a few questions, guys, before we wrap up. A recording will be sent out in the next two to three days. Um, you'll get a link via email. Um, do you get paid during your foundation? year yes you do um what are good grades so you want to look at the a and a stars which i understand is the nines if, if i'm correct that's the higher numbers um can the uh, so we we can extend the work experience sale that shouldn't be a problem but keep an eye out on it because it may it may finish at any point so we'll try and extend it for you guys uh i went to uh i went to sixth form by the way whoever's question that was about which secondary school uh, I went to Sydney Stringer and I went to the sixth form within that. Okay, we'll do probably two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, is pharmacy work experience useful for medical school application? Yes and no. Yes, because it shows that you've got some idea of other allied healthcare professionals, but you want something a bit more specific, hospital, GP, or a virtual work experience where possible. And then the last question I'm just going to cherry pick. Um, let's see. So this is going to be... Uh, so Freddie says, can you finish medical school and FY1 and FY2 and then move to another country? The answer is yes, you can. Uh, lots of doctors move to uh, Australia, America, um, Europe, 
and the Middle East, that's not a problem. So Dr. Sand, if you want to choose one more question, perhaps one of a few more questions that you'd like to answer, and then obviously we'll wrap up from there. Uh, so nothing so I, specific, actually, just to let you know, really. So a couple of things, I'm just going to do a quick screen share, Mary, if that's all right. So um, uh, yes. Um, what? So fair enough. So we've got um, just give me one second. So um, someone's got a question about eth a few of you on eth ethical and a good book for ethics. I'm going to put in the link um, for you guys in the next two three minutes. So just give us a moment. Yeah, so just keeping us. So what we'll do is we do have a lot of other support networks. So there's lots of repetitive questions that we've noticed. So um, we have got social media channels that you can use. If you go on to iMedics at Inspire underscore Medics, you have got lots of uh, revision material. Now the reason we we've got we've got lots of latest medical news, which is very important. So if you've got interviews coming up, um, you can keep a track when they ask you what was the last medical thing you read. There's lots of relevant stuff about the COVID vaccine and so forth. So it's worth having a look at that. We're also on Instagram. So we've got inspire underscore medics, which is our Instagram page. Um, so there's lots of motivational uh, quotes and pictures, but there's also lots of clinical stuff like here's a condition called Gilbert syndrome. And it's got some of the key details about it. So you know, if you're passionate about medicine, these are the kind of things you want to start doing now, get used to it, read about these things. And if this doesn't excite you, you know, vestibular urinitis, you know, common upper limb fractures and so forth, then it probably isn't the career for you, but you need to kind of understand, get yourself familiar with it. So have a look at our Instagram page, inspire underscore medics. And this is what the um, med school entry um, Facebook group looks like. So there's just people trying to um, access it now, I think as well, but we'll... Um... So guys, I'm just going to put in a link for the ethics, uh, the ethical cases book uh, for for medicine that we recommend. It's a very very good book. I use it myself. We recommend it to all our doctors as well. Um, and there'll be a link that you can access in Zoom in the next 20 seconds. So, so this is what the um, Facebook group will look like. So um, do don't forget to join up to that. So what we'll be doing is we'll be adding some new kind of um, um, content in there for you guys. Um, so you can have a look at it um, and use it for your kind of um, revision. Um, if there's any questions that you have, again, we can use it. So here it is, the medical med school entry preparation, relatively new group. Uh, but some of you asked about webinars and things and personal statements. If you go back, here's, here's one of our previous ones, the ethics and law webinar that we did. Um, and lots of other stuff in there, blogs as well that we've got on the website that you'll find useful. Um, but you know you'll go back and you'll see some of our previous teaching that we've done so this is in the medical school entry preparation group um which like we said is on facebook um and i'll stop the screen share there okay guys last couple of things before we wrap up number one don't forget to leave us a google review we'd really really appreciate it i've just put in the link for you guys um, into Zoom. It literally takes 20 seconds. Um, it's a free webinar that we've done by two GPs. We're taking our time out on a Sunday evening. This is a small uh, comment to show your appreciation. Would really, really appreciate that. Secondly, this webinar will be uploaded and it is it has been recorded. It'll be uploaded onto YouTube and you'll get a link to the email so you can go back to this video recording in future if you want to go over the material. Number three, we are, we are going to have some more webinars in the very near future to do with the UK CAT BMAT and personal statements. You'll get an email, so please check your email inboxes and also your spam folder. Sometimes the email goes into the spam folder. A lot of you have had questions, and unfortunately, we haven't been able to answer, so we do apologize. There's over 100 questions, and obviously, we're limited on time. And then finally, um, oh, so okay, so what Francis says, where can you leave a review? Uh, so, Francis, let me show you. So, when you get to the, um, so I'm just going to do a screen share. Francis and show you what so when you get to to that page on Google if you click on the so on the right hand side or if it's your mobile device there'll be iMedics and then there'll be website directions and there'll be Google reviews if you click on that there'll be a pop-up box that comes and then you can click on the write a review button um, and then that will allow you to write a review for us hopefully a nice review if you don't mind um, but that's how you do it essentially um, so I'm just going to bounce 
out of there for a second. Um, so yeah, so, you'll, so the next uh, three webinars will be on BMAT, UK CAT, personal statements, obviously in the lead up into the summer. Um, if you are thinking about virtual work experience, guys, uh, Dr. Sandu is probably going to put in the link, or I'll put in the link for you. Um, do book into it. It's really, really useful in terms of the stuff that you'll learn. If you found today useful, the virtual work experience will be like, whoa, uh, the, the, because we've got so many different things in it. And of course, let your friends and colleagues know if you can share our platform. Um, with them. Um, our ambassador program is currently going through batch three. So you can be an ambassador for iMedics. You can work with us, me and Dr. Sandu and our team. Uh, and you can put that in your personal statement. Uh, but the, the current batch is going through the interview selection process. So that's batch three. But batch four will open up in a few months' time. And then you guys can apply for batch four if you're interested in becoming an ambassador. Uh, would we have to work our camera for the work? No. Okay. So for, for the virtual work experience, you do not need to put your camera on. It's, it's, it's very similar to the setup that you have in this webinar right now. Um, okay, guys, I think that's it pretty much from our side. We will be in touch. Keep an eye out for your emails, your, your junk folders as well. Uh, Olivia, if you want to apply for the ambassador program, um, I'll send you the link. I'll send you the link now. I think there's an article on it, and then it talks you through how you can apply. So... If I just send you that link in the chat box, uh, Olivia, it's in the chat box there. Uh, have a read. Uh, do check out the videos on our YouTube channel as well. Um, I think the link's there. Computer's a bit laggy now. We've got so many people. No, I don't think the link's there. I'm just going to paste it in there. So the link's how to apply to the Ambassador Pro. Oh, yeah, it is there. Yeah, so Olivia, it's there if you want to have a read. And then, of course, don't forget to mention it to your friends and colleagues. Guys, don't forget the Google review. I keep on mentioning this, but if you, it'd be really, really kind of you to do that. Uh, Dr. Sandu, anything you want to add before we wrap up? Because everybody's saying thank you and yeah. leaving us nice messages. Yeah, so absolutely. So we appreciate that. So um, some really nice Google reviews that we've had. So we appreciate that. This kind of, We've had a couple of odd reviews as well um which is a little bit harsh because we obviously are gps and we have come out of our own time uh, to give you support so we've had two kind of controversial ones which are a bit weird considering the majority i think we've had 30 really positive reviews from you guys so uh, we appreciate that obviously if you don't appreciate what we do you don't have to join us you know we're, we're coming out of our own time and we're here to help you guys and we've done very well so far with um the sixth form and graduate students that have gone through our programs uh, practicing gp so we're still working we still have you know busy schedules um and obviously we're trying to plan ahead and we're doing things uh, to try and support you guys so thank you very much for everyone who's joined it was a huge turnout on here it was a huge turnout on youtube and um, we look forward to seeing you um at some of the and again some really nice comments and, and i think this is why we do it so when we saw those two I would call rather harsh comments apart from the other 40 or so that went up that have been really good um, i can see some great comments already coming in from you guys so we appreciate that we do it for you guys you know we're not here for um people to kind of say what i'd say silly things um, we expect potential doctors to have that level of kind of um skill and etiquette to deal with these kind of situations in a respectful way and you guys have done that and we're seeing it again really nice comments coming through so we really appreciate that uh, so all that's left to say then is obviously um, don't give up that's the most important thing so lots of you have raised a similar thing some of you are worried about grades uh, you're worried about uh, choices that you've made do not worry if you put your mind to it and you really want to become doctors you are going to get there whether you get there in the next two years um, whether you get there in the next three years whether you go on the graduate route um, you will get there. It's just the fact of how you deal with setbacks. Um, some of you may feel dejected if you don't get the grades or if you miss by, or if you have got the grades, but you don't succeed at interview. Um, but do not worry because we've seen it. We've been through it ourselves uh, and we've seen others go through it and they've come through and they are now, you know, second or third year medical students. Some of them are junior doctors. Um, so they have succeeded. So um, the key thing to take away from all of our webinar series is do not give up. Um, and do not let any setbacks hold you back because people have gone there before you, people have stumbled and failed before you, but they've gone on to succeed and become successful doctors. So um, last word from me really. So hope you're all safe, Keep hope your families are safe and we look forward to seeing you either at the work experience or at some of our up and coming free webinars in the next 
few weeks since then. Okay, thank you guys.